beautiful, crisp Canadian morning, huh? Awesome. I wanted to welcome everyone to, uh, to Alia. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jeff and his team, uh, uh, together with our friends from Zeiss, uh, have, are, are here to present to you um, the, the subject matter that you've, you've seen on the agenda. Um, they put a lot of effort into putting this together, so um, have fun. Enjoy your day, and um, any questions that you have, the team is here to, uh, to respond to. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I think we want to start off, uh, Frank said hello to everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to just quickly start off with the uh, short for, uh, video of the Elliott corporate video. It's just something we just had produced recently. Just tells you a little bit about what Elliot does. A lot of people don't understand the relationship, you know, what Elliot, how Elliot functions and Zeiss function together in the Canadian market. So I'm going to show something from Elliot and something from Zeiss, and we'll uh, we'll start those off. I just have a, a quick video here. To get. We're looking for the competitive edge. This is something that we're very conscious of in providing the best service and support that the industry can offer. We represent best in class machines. This provides our customers the ability to become more and more productive. I see companies being able to grow and we see that as success for them and ultimately success for Elliott Metzger. We represent 13 different manufacturers of machine tools coast to coast in Canada, from milling to turning to coordinate migrant machines to fabrication equipment. Matsura, Nakamura, Zeiss CMMs, Brother, Burko, that makes us different. Basically, it's a one-stop shop. We are a complete in-house service from installation, calibration, interface, or additional axis. That's our strength. Because of the level of experience, we can provide a very, very thorough solution and maybe provide some ideas that the customers have never seen before in the industry. Manufacturing has become much more complicated. The skill level, I would say, has not kept up. So we find ourselves today more acting as a consultant and a solutions provider than really just selling the machinery itself. We have 14 application engineers on staff to be able to help our customers with their learning curve after machine installation to be able to start making components for that customer very quickly. Elliott Matsur uh, has the most service techs and application engineers based in Canada. So we are there responding to calls. We do not leave a customer behind, as they say. For me to come in and work with this team, second to none. Yes, I can say it's 67 years strong, but it's the actual personnel I get to work with. So 25, 30 years plus. You can't put a price tag on that. I've had a relationship with Elliot Matsura for about 30 years. I've worked with the same engineers, I would say, over the last 25 years, and it completely changed the way that we do our business. It's not just a question of buying a piece of equipment. It goes much deeper than that. Frank Hadar and his team have helped us uh, put more machines in here than we would have otherwise been able to afford. We're about to buy a fifth machine, so I think it's, uh, it's worked. The relationship with Elliot is a true partnership in every sense of the word. When they make a commitment, they stand by that. And the level of service and support that we receive from them is really second to none. Here at CNS Systems, there's four people. It's myself, father, my brother, and then our home desk looks as well. Elliot Matsura's financing options enabled us to purchase the high-end equipment that we've always wanted. So we probably wouldn't be in this business today had it not been for Elliot Matsura. We work with industries across many different disciplines, from oil and gas to aerospace to mold and dye. We offer products that are able to mill, turn, even additive manufacturing. The key to our success is finding skills they need to make them successful. Ce qui différencie Elliott Matsura principalement de la compétition, je dirais, c'est au niveau du service, plus technologique également, parce que le marché a tendance à devenir beaucoup plus high tech. We, as management team and with our engineers and our sales team, try to build the trust, the confidence in the customer so that 
they know when they come to visit Elliot or they require support from Elliot, they're getting the best in the industry. We have a ratio of four technical people for every one of the 12 sales engineers that we have out on the road. This is support that our customer need to keep their machines up and running, making money. This is just a selection of some of the excellent companies we work for in Canada and help them to uh, stay productive. So I'm just going to play another quick video, just a little bit to explain a little bit about Zeiss. A lot of people don't understand uh, Zeiss either as a company, and it's such a large company, it has many different divisions, and the video will go through some of those things and some of the remarkable uh, achievements that Zeiss has on a world scale, changing, changing the planet really for the better. So the kind of the thing I wanted to emphasize with these two videos, you have two companies that are very, very stable uh, in the Canadian market. Elliot Motor Service, 65 years. Partnership with Zeiss over 20 years now. Uh, Frank Boliero, we're there to be able to support you in the Frank long term like for projects three. that you have. Um, I think at this point, we're ready to start at the educational portion. So that's all you're going to see from any kind of sales stuff at this point. I don't want to bore you with a lot of things like that. but. Um, we'll turn it over to our colleague Jim York, who everybody knows in the industry as well for over 20 years. And uh, get over to your Chromecast. There we go. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming to join us here at Elliott Machinery today uh, for this Zeiss Lunch and Learn. For those of you uh, that 
don't know who I am, I am Jim York. I'm a senior metrologist here with uh, Elliott Machinery for the Carl Zeiss product line. I've been with uh, Elliott Machinery for over 12 years now, teaching people how to measure everything. And I want to teach you today about how to measure things a little bit better than maybe you've ever done before. So I want you to learn to scan like you mean it, and that's uh, part of what I want to talk about today as far as uh, our technical presentations uh, go. The scanning that I want to talk about today, though, is tactile scanning. And everyone in this uh, room with this ice measuring instrument uh, so far with the CMM has tactile scanning capability. And of course, that we know is the uh, continuous contact data acquisition uh, through our, our VAST probing. And we, we may have our active VAST probing, like the picture here, the VAST XTR, which is our rotating active probe, which has uh, been a fairly new addition to our technology. Or you may be using the VAST XXT, and I know there's a couple of VAST XXT users here in the room today, uh, and that is our, our lightweight passive scanning technology that is meant to go uh, on our Duramax uh, line, but also on our RDS rotating sensor for that added flexibility added onto scanning systems, and that's uh, the sort of scanning that I want to talk about <coughs> with us today. So we have uh, a classic example here of touch triggering versus scan. And, and if you're here and you have a Zeiss machine, you already know all the great benefits to using scanning as your data acquisition method. When you touch trigger, you can miss flaws, and that results, you can see here, in different centers, different diameters, different values, and that inconsistency in, in your data, of course, is going to provide you with lots of guessing rather than lots of measurement. The use of scanning technology means that we will get the same result with either measurement here because we are looking at the entire circumference of the diameter of this particular case. But the question then becomes, how do we know how to really scan? Now, if you've been through our Calypso training, and I know some of you have because I have personally trained probably most of you at some point or another, uh, then I know that you know that scanning is how you want to take the data, but learning how much data and how to, to manage it once you've got it, that's something that we speak about in training, sometimes in platitudes, and not with an exact methodology for you to understand. How many points do you put? How fast should you be scanning? What sort of filters and outliers do you use? Even what size of stylus should you choose to optimally acquire the measurements that you need? <coughs> so I want to talk today about the Zeiss Scanning Cookbook. And I want to uh, really encourage you to investigate the cookbook after this session and see if it fits for you. The cookbook is going to help you generate a recipe, if you forgive the term, for getting the best possible data consistently and without a great deal of debate. And many of you work in an environment where you are not the only metrologist. And this is true uh, in many, many of our customers where one person may be more or less experienced or have different opinions, and you can get into some conflict on how much data to acquire, what to do exactly with that data. And the cookbook is here to help us resolve that information so that you can make a better, more educated, uh, let's say, approach to your data acquisition. When we are measuring, we have to decide why we're measuring. Why are we acquiring the data? Essentially, in metrology, there are quintessentially two types of inspections. Functional inspection or process inspection. Now, a functional inspection is probably by, probably by default what we all are shooting to do. This is what we're usually after if we're following the manufacturing drawing. We've all taken another drawing. We've looked at the items. There will be geometric dimensioning and tolerancing values. There will just be things like diameters, lengths, and widths. 
And when you consider these, the, these requests, they are more than likely to be functional requests. You know, true position, profile, perpendicularity, roundness, flatness, all of these things are functional values. And we have to be able to understand them in a direct way. <laughs> a process check, though, this is where we start to say, OK, now that we're making a good part, how do we maintain that acquisition of good parts so that we can ship all good parts to our customers? This is especially important for everyone here that is in a production environment. I know some of you here are making small samples, one-offs, ones or twos. But many of you are making thousands and thousands of the same parts every year. And you don't want to make rash decisions about your uh, process modification on your machine tools. So these are two different types of measurements. We have to understand that in the process control, we're looking at averages. But in the functional check, we're looking at actual fitting conditions. And the methodology that you use to acquire either of these changes based on those values. So I've got a sample here today, and for those of you that have taken lots of ice training, you probably recognize this snippet of a drawing, because this is, of course, the Zeiss training block, the CAD cube that we use for a lot of our Zeiss training classes here. And we have a value of a 30 millimeter measurement, plus or minus 50 microns, and a 50 micron roundness value. This is going to be a functional check. And the reason that we know it's a functional check is because of the geometric dimensioning and tolerance. That implies the need to acquire a functional value. So how do we know how to get this value? How can we do it properly? Inside of the cookbook, and this is a little snippet from my personal cookbook, there are diagrams and charts for you to follow to know exactly what to do. The cookbook is going to take you through a process to establish the methodology best adapted to your particular requirement. So let's consider for a moment my arrows here. Now, so the arrow on the left is the size range of the feature. Well, this is a 30 millimeter diameter that we're inspecting. So this falls under the 26 to 80 millimeter zone. And we are finding, in this particular case, a functional diameter. So we can see that there's a Z100DF value right here. This is a functional diameter. And inside the cookbook, there's classifications that you can follow. But I didn't want to bore you. So I'll just tell you that this is a functional uh, value here. So based on that functional value, where the two intersect, you will see that there is a setting here for A, and P, and of course, A is our active scanning technology, and P is the passive scanning technology. Active scanning technology is going to be way faster. And if you have an active scanning probe, and I know many of you in the room do have an active scanning probe, you know that you can go faster because of how the probe is constructed. The active scanning is able to constantly adjust and modify the exact force it's applying to the surface. That allows for a more consistent measurement, and therefore you can acquire the data at a much higher rate. When you are considering a passive scanner, for instance, if you're using a vast XXT on, let's say, a Contura machine, you might uh, then want to, you know, definitely would want to have things go a little bit slower. And you can see here that we're recommending five millimeters per second, 10 millimeters per second for the active scanning. If we move along the line, you can see that we are suggesting a minimum of 1,270 points on this diameter with a coverage of 380 degrees. Now, you may remember from Calypso training, if you've had Calypso training, that we overlap the 360 degrees to allow for the the point masking that Calypso does at the beginning and ending of a scan. This is the time where your probe is most likely to be vibrating. We want to make sure that we eliminate those bad points and acquire data that is useful around the entire circumference. The maximum probe size that we're suggesting is three millimeters in diameter. 
having a probe that is too large will act as a mechanical filter and you may miss important details and flaws on your actual feature if the probe is too big. But if the probe is too small, what may happen is that you may pick up uh, extra vibration from your surface finish on the, on the measurement, and that will also derive your measurement and give you a worse value. So it's important to understand that you have to use the right size tool as well as use that tool at the correct speed. So here they're su suggesting a maximum of three millimeters. Now what we are looking at as we move into larger features is the requirement for a larger stylus. So if you have a very large feature, so uh, we're looking at over 10 inches in diameter or 250 millimeters in diameter, so if you're making very large parts, that's where you're looking at those eight and 10 millimeter ruby styli for something of that size. But when you're looking at smaller features like this, you can see three millimeters is the suggested maximum value. <clears throat> when we combine these values together, that is going to allow us to understand how do we apply our measurement strategy? Inside of our Calypso interface, we can then set the appropriate speed, the appropriate amount of points, and the coverage as per the cookbook. And if you're following the cookbook in this way, you and your colleagues will always be able to consistently apply a measurement strategy that will result in a good, stable, and usable measurement. Now, there, there may be times that you want to take even more data. There may be times that you want to scan a little bit faster because you want the measurement to be done faster. Well, that's where valuable tools like Navigator come into play. But these values from the cookbook are based on not having the Navigator function for your CMS. Now, one of the next things that we have to consider is how the strategy will come into play. Not just what the strategy will be, but how we will deploy it. This depends on the depth of the feature. If you take a look over on uh, the screen here, we can see if you are one to three times the diameter, we re recommend a cylinder with three circle paths for a location, or a cylinder with three circle paths for a form analysis. And because we have a form analysis, naturally we should be measuring this feature cylindrically, not as a circle. Measuring a circle is, is typically meant Five, line one, please. Five, line one. when we are inspecting a feature that is quite short. This is sometimes it's not plausible to measure cylindrically in that, in that particular case. But our depth of our feature today is 40 millimeters deep, which is more than the diameter, and therefore a cylinder is advisable. So this is one of those things too where I get asked all the time, when should I measure a cylinder? When should I measure a circle? And in my training classes, I typically say, you should always try to measure a cylinder because then you, you will be able to properly understand whether or not the bore is at the correct angle, which of course is critical for our true position. But here we have a, a hard and fast rule that you can follow by applying the curve. The next thing that we have to consider are filters and outliers. Filters and outliers are often a point of contention with many companies because they say, well, we've applied them, but they haven't done anything. And almost undoubtedly, I will visit and find that they are acquiring 10 or 12 points on their diameters or other features, and this is why they've not met the minimum data threshold. So if you are applying the cookbook strategy for data acquisition, the filtering is going to be applicable to your measurement. But what settings should you be using? Well, based on the size of our feature, we will be using the undulations per revolution filter of 150 undulations. Well, why is this important? Because we want to assume in this particular case that the feature is reasonably round and a feature of that size will have that many wavelengths inside. We're both going to be using a Gauss filter with low pass. This is a typical filter methodology for regular geometry. The other types of filters that are there are for things like surface finish. And we'll be talking about the things like surface finish and geometry a little bit later on here this morning. 
As far as outlier elimination goes, we want to make sure that we eliminate more than a single point. If you are taking a point about every 100 microns or so, you would measure approximately four to six points over the face of a grain of salt or sand. And you can imagine that if you were in the casting industry, that the presence of sand in sand castings obviously will be fairly prevalent. If we hit a grain of sand inside of our measurement, we want to make sure that Calypso can eliminate that grain of sand from our consideration. Of course, one of the most common uh, outliers that we may encounter would be a human hair, which is approximately 100 to 200 microns wide. So making sure that you eliminate more than a single outlier will allow you to be sure that a hair or a grain of sand or any other sort of dirt will naturally be removed from the data set. Taking 30 or 40 points out of a 1,200 plus point set will not affect the results of your measurement at all other than positively. One confusion that I do get sometimes is the value here called uh, pre-filtering, which you can see down in this portion here. The pre-filtering value is 10 to 5,000 undulations per revolution. What is that for? This basically says if we have fewer than 10 undulations on our geometry, there's probably a gross error there. I bet if you think about something that has two undulations per revolution, you may have even had it for breakfast today, an egg. If you have an oval-shaped diameter, that is considered to be a small number of undulations, like two undulations per revolution. This will help to uh, hide that gross deformity, find all your outliers, and do so in a repeatable way so that your measurement results can be consistent even with bad deformity on your overall features. If you do any turning and you get uh, lobing, it will also pre-filter for lobing. And that will help ensure that there is a great deal of stability in your calculation. Now, one final thing that we have to consider when we're setting up our feature is the calculation method. If we're looking at a functional value that means that we must be considering not a least squares average amount, which is the default that you will see for most geometry in Calypso is the average feature, which is great for process control. But in the case of our diameter, we should be looking at the maximum inscribed diameter for the calculation of the size if it's functional. If you've ever used a bore gauge, kind of, uh, please come or you've ever had a time where you uh, are inserting a pin into a hole in order to check its size, what you are really doing there is you are simulating a maximum inscribed diameter. So if you have ever measured a feature on your CMM and said, hey, this is the value I've got, but someone from your machining department has come and said, well, I put this pin in, and so I think the value is this much, and you don't agree, it's quite likely because you're looking at the least squares average value, and they're effectively looking at the maximum inscribed value. And that's where a lot of consternation can happen between your manufacturing people and your quality people. So using the maximum inscribed diameter will allow you to simulate hard gauging. And that's an important fa facet for your calculations as well. You can see here in a functional check the maximum inscribed diameter on my imaginary diameter here is much smaller than the average diameter that would be calculated uh, through the Gaussian circle. And that being the case, you know you're going to get a different answer than someone putting a pin gauge into the feature. You can simulate these hard gauges in Calypso as well by following the cookbook and using the proper settings according to the values that you need. And when it all comes down to it, you're able then to evaluate that form tolerance, and you can do so very easily and present it in a nice way using our PyWare reporting interface. There is one small calculation difference, though, between the diameter and the roundness. And the roundness value is using a Chebyshev calculation, which is a minimum feature calculation. And this is a requirement under the ASME standard. Calypso will do this for you automatically, so you don't have to remember to turn this one on. Calypso will just do that for the feature directly whenever it's applied. That's it for me. Thank you very much, everyone. 
I will now uh, turn things back over to Jeff for a moment. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Jim. Uh, hope everybody learned something new about filtering. I know it's a topic, as I mentioned to someone earlier, that's a little bit maligned. People don't fully understand why we apply different filters and what works. And it's a good educational uh, topic. So, if there's, uh, is there any are any pressing questions yeah, that anyone wants to ask at this time? Go ahead. Here. When they use maximum inscribed, how many points actually? <coughs> the maximum inscribed algorithm will use the three innermost points uh, on the diameter to do the calculation. This is why the filtering and outlier elimination is critical in order to get a consistent value. Anyone well, else? The only problem I have when I use it, if there's a little bit of dust, you know, pick it out and uh, dust. And that's, that's why having the right amount of data and using the proper uh, outlier elimination is going to mitigate that problem. The, I would say it's, it's easier to measure the feature correctly than to measure it twice. It's way faster. So if you apply all the correct settings at the beginning and you are simulating the gate hard gauging that they will be using, you'll get a lot more agreeability between yourself and your manufacturing team. And that starts with uh, selecting the, the data the right way, and that's part of what the cookbook does. And if you want to get your own Zeiss cookbook, you can order one from the Zeiss web shop. Uh, and the, those cookbook, the cookbooks on the web shop are, are really nice. They're in hardcover. It's a really uh, nice, sharp looking book. And I highly recommend uh, picking up your own Zeiss cookbook. It's uh, really very helpful. Anyone else have questions? Oh, was that a turn? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, using the, the, the Yes. Why not the distance? You you could use a suitable distance as well. Uh, you could probably find that that value typically works in around seventy some odd uh, microns or so uh, for circular features for internal diameters. But the calcula the, me the calculation methods then change when you consider outside diameters versus inside diameters, and there's other values that you would more likely apply to uh, linear or planar features. So the cookbook covers all of that. But it also says, oh, but if you, if you are checking sheet metal, here's what you should do. If you are checking uh, parallelism between features, here's how it changes. So it's reactive to not just the type of feature, but also the measurement requirement. And that's one of the great values of the cookbook method is that you're you're never stuck with, well, I don't think I need this many points for the diameter compared to the cylindricity or something. And the answer to that is yes. So you can then say, well, which one's the worst case scenario? And usually apply that method to that feature. And this really allows you to tune your inspections to get the best performance overall. Because you might say, well, some of these things make my measurements slower but it's like I said, it's it's better to measure slower than measure twice. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Okay. Well, I think at that point uh, we're going to introduce Andy Bredwell from Zeiss. He's our uh, SF and G expert, so it's surface form and geometry. Uh, we will uh, load up his presentation here, and uh, let's just put this on standby for a second. And I will be, if anyone thinks I have other questions they want to ask, I will be available later on. Thank you, sir. Switch inputs. So I'm going to give you the mouse that I need to. Uh, and then we'll just take right over. Um, and you can do it right from there. That's long enough for the wireless to work. Good morning. Thank you guys for coming out. And let me see where it's going to be right now. I'm turn it off. Today, uh, we'll Today we will cover uh, some applications for surface textures, principles, and parameters. Some different information from there. Uh, a lot of you guys already use some of the equipment. I do have several slides, some of them are just introductory to kind of tell you what I'll be explaining in some of the following slides. So we'll 
try to move fast through some and a little slower through others. So basically the agenda is we're going to look at the surface structure or surface texture basics, some of the equipment, filter separation, some setup conditions, different parameters, look quickly into what those are, and some of the tune-ups for SF and G equipment. As you look at different types of gauges, we've already covered some of this. We, we start with a product shape, then we kind of go into GD and T, then it kind of branches off into surface. For some of the dimensions, form, and position, it is done with a 3D machine, such as a CMM. But some, for some of these, we can get into a, a me form measuring machine, contour measuring machine, which are 2D machines. Uh, we do have some equipment set up here. In the measurement lab, we do have several of the SF&G pieces of equipment set up. You're welcome to look at it a little bit later today. And also, we get into the surface side of it, which is waviness, roughness, and we have measuring equipment for that as well. So today, we'll be looking a little bit more at, mostly into the surface portion of it and some of the settings and parameters there. Why measure surface texture? It's on the print, customer's supplier conformance, making sure that the customer, the supplier are all getting the same thing. ISO, QS standards, let's make sure that we're all there. Functional characteristics, visual characteristics, and process control. A lot of us, we measure it just because it's on the print, but truly as already mentioned earlier, we're wanting to make sure that whatever part we're making functions properly and we're ensuring that to the customer. And we can also use this information to control our process in the future. So we look at some different profiles of contour, 3D, surface, polar form. We can see different types of things. Here we see a 3D map of surface finish. We can see a contour. This here will be a polar is around this measurement. Here we look at a couple different graphs here. We have the 2D surface profiles. Uh, we have the profile curve and the roughness curve. We see how the profile curve kind of varies a little bit up and down from the main line, where the surface finish is kind of flattened out with some form removal on it. So you kind of see a little bit of difference in the two graphs. There are a lot of standards that we can go by. Uh, and I'm going to be saying this all the way through the presentation. Check your print. A lot of times you need to check your print, see what the print says first. Uh, as we go, we'll offer other suggestions to help you make decisions if it may not be on your print. A lot of ASME and ISO standards, some of the JIS and DIN standards, again, many standards out there, and the documentation and the information is out there. A lot of times we'll see this symbol on our drawing, the surface symbol, sometimes we may not understand exactly what all the different ones are. But if we look at this here, we can kind of see the breakdown of what we have. We have the measured machining allowance, the second surface parameters. We have how it's supposed to be uh, arrived at this surface finish, manufacturing <coughs> method, surface parameter and condition. So as we look over here, maybe we'll see something like this. And this is a perfect drawing, you might say, where you have all of the information you need. And a lot of times you don't. A lot of times you just see the check mark box with an RA of five or something like that. And we have to kind of go backwards to get to that point. But as you see the breakdown here, maybe the, about the method is a three, and it tells us here what we need. And you can see the breakdown. We have our upper lower limit for our controls, our filter that we need to use, 2RC in this case. We have our transmission bands. It tells us where we should set our cutoffs and wavelengths and filters as well. We also have our parameter, what we're looking to obtain. In this case, it would be an RZ. The number of sampling links that we would want to acquire, five is a default. And how you want to judge this is a 16% or a max. In this case, we want RZ3 max and a value limit in microns. ASME, ISO, again, this kind of just as a follow-up to show you a little bit about something. A lot of times we'll just see the check mark again. 
A is your roughness value in RA. B is your production method, treatment, coding, other text, your call out. Uh, C will be your cutoff or sampling length. The direction will A is D. E is mineral ma material removal requirement. F is roughness value other than RA and if preceded by its parameter symbol, such as RZ 0 0.4, and the material removal method. If we look at a sample, and this one here is set up on the standard five uh, nominal lengths cutoff, what we end up getting is we get out of this, maybe this is what our true trace is, and that is our primary profile. From this you see our mean line through our primary profile, and that would be our waviness. So in this case you can see one, two, three, four, five sample links. This machine was set up for pre-travel and post-travel. So a lot of times as you start ramping up or slowing down your drive motors, maybe you have a little interference. So what they've done, they have drive preparatory length or pre and post-travel elimination. So in this case, we have set it to take a half of a sample length off of the beginning and the end. From each of these, you can see as we apply our filters and take this section here, leveling it out, this section leveling it out then we end up with our roughness value. So a lot of times when we talk about cutoff links, we're talking about the sample links within. If I say five nominal links, whatever you're, if you're using a 0.8 cutoff, it would be five times 0.8. Let's look at the equipment just for a minute. Again, there are many different types <coughs> of systems. We have our profiling instruments. Today we're going to be talking mostly about stylus type instruments, inductive, tactile, touch type measuring. Kind of a breakdown of what happens is you have your measuring machine. A lot of us have maybe the computerized that are on the stand and everything's motorized and it's very nice. Or maybe you just have a simple machine that you just touch on the part, maybe the little handheld units or whatever, but basically the process is the same. You still have your stylus tip, your probe, your whatever it may be, LVDT, your drive unit which makes it move across. It's fed into an amplifier, then the ADC which gives you your total profile. From there you start adding filters and you get primary profile, roughness profile, and waviness profiles out of it. Again, you may have something set up nice where you have a fixture to align the part to the workpiece. You may have extra axes to make sure that you are in the correct place. Two different types of measurement for a surface finish. We have a skidded and a non-skidded. The skidded measurement is just what it says. If you look here, you can kind of see a little thing here where your stylus is behind it, this is your skid datum with your stylus. In this case, you can see the skid in the front of the picture here. The skidded measurement a lot of times are on the smaller units. The skidded measurement instrument is for roughness only. You can't do waviness or profile on it. It's less prone to noise and vibration where the skid is actually touching the workpiece helps dampen the noise and vibration. It's an industry default to monitor processes. This is a really good application for a shop floor, a low cost, and also a lot of times seen on the portable machines. A skid with a large radius datum removes long form error and shape. Again, with a large radius, basically what you're ha happening is you can have a little bit of mechanical filtration here where the skid is dampening some of that error, form error there, and it also, with the skid, it helps protect your stylus from damage because it's not letting it drop into different foreseen places. A lot of times with the, uh, I've not really mentioned it, for a surface finish you do need to use the diamond tip for the standards, and sometimes with a small diamond tip it's easy to get into a place and damage your tip. But with a skid, it does help protect you from that. The profilometer system, it's a motorized drive system. 
uh, with feedback, Z probe detector, stylus, surface analyzer, PC based or handheld. Again, we're showing that we have some type of processor to help you take care of this data. Let's look just a second at the skidless systems. The skidless measuring instruments are used to measure all types. I'll be as we go into some other slides, you're going to see PW and R profile, waviness, and roughness forms. The skid measurements, with no skid, you can measure all of these areas in profile, waviness, and roughness. And we can also get into a more confined area. With a skidded instrument, we do have to have a little space to put the skid out in front of the stylus. With the skidless, a lot of times you can get back into that tight corner a little bit easier. But again, you are a little bit less protected. Most of your skidless systems, you do have an X scale positioning, so you <coughs> are able to position to a repeatable place a lot of times. Reference range, and this type of system has minimal systematic noise. Skidless systems are, again, prone to a little bit of vibration, though. Filter separations, so profiles and filters is what we'll look at next. How big is roughness? Really depends on what you're looking at. Are you looking at the craters on the moon? The ship in the sea? The cobblestones in your driveway? Sandpaper, roughness, or am I looking at how rough is the glass on my lenses? of my glasses, making it hard to see. So a lot of times, taking into effect what we're looking at may change our thoughts of roughness. What cut cutoff should I use? As you can see here, you can see this blown up. This probably represents a two micron tip stylus so you can tell there's quite a bit of magnification we're getting into small places so roughness can vary so again our stylus and our contact play a big part into this this is kind of the same diagram as what we've seen before showing the machine again arriving at the total profile a lot we need to look at our tip selection as well at what we're looking at. This is just a clip out of a section. As we get into these sections, uh, the Zeiss and Acrotech, they provide a lot of good information. If you use their machines, they have pages and pages of helpful hints to help you choose the correct. Some of the software will even assist you going through the software itself of choosing that. But again, according to your stylus tip, again, like I already mentioned, if you're measuring surface finish, you need to use the diamond tip, maybe a 2 micron, 5 or 10 micron, 2 micron is your most common. According to your stylus tip, maybe you want to use a different size of cutoff value as well. Again, as we apply these cutoff values and uh, filters, short wavelength filters, we see that, again, a breakdown of how we get to these different points again. Profile curves, uh, surface types. Profile is a total unfiltered data leveled with a shape removed. Total profile includes an error in geometric form. <coughs> Andy, line two, please. Andy, line two. Waviness, long wavelengths, machine rigidity, chatter, feedback, and vibration is what we're talking about with waviness. Waviness uh, profiles, roughness heights attenuated. Roughness, short wavelengths, tool marks, processing, a lot of the deformation that you see while you're machining can be picked up in our roughness values. Again, we are looking at a couple different charts here and I do believe if I remember correctly these are about the same. So you can see here our uh, profile as we measured it in. Maybe our sample wasn't a perfectly flat sample. You see our waviness profile through the mean line of this to see what the waviness is. 
but once we see the waviness profile removed, suppressed, we get again with the uh, leveling type technique, and we'll talk about that just a little bit in a minute, we get the roughness profile. Different types of filter characteristics, uh, we're looking at a few here. The 2RC75, it's an emulated 75% pass RC filter, non-face corrected. A lot of times you see this on some of your older equipment, it's prone to Gibbs effect. The 2RC emulate 75 face corrected is still a little bit prone to a Gibbs effect. The Gaussian is a 50% transmission weighted digital filter. It's less error, but still some Gibbs effect. Good frequency, suppressed ISO default. Again, kind of like a best fit. The Gaussian and the spline, a robust spline, uh, seem to be the two most commonly used I'm seeing today. Robust spline or robust Gaussian 50% transmission pure digital filter ISO bandpass. Less prone to stylus, equipment vibration, little or no filter edges, and it handles outliers a little bit differently. More for graphical is basically the rolling ball radius. So, kind of show a little bit of an example of each of these guys here is the out of phase, the 2RC. You can kind of see the profile and the uh, roughness a little bit separated. Once you get the face corrected, everything lines up with each other a little bit better. We look at the uh, profile with the 2RC and the Gaussian. Again, this is our profile. If we take a sample here, you can kind of see the profile overshoot with a 2RC. Gaussian does a little bit better job with it to help eliminate the Gibbs effect. Again, if we look at the Gaussian filter, we're going to take this section of our profile and we flatten that section out. Again, with a five sample length, you kind of see how this works here. Through each of these. So robust filter advantages. On the left, we have our profile waviness. In the center graph here, we have our roughness. The gauze in with a 0.8 cutoff versus the robust spline with a 0.8 cutoff. You can kind of see how it does your waviness line just ever so slightly different with the overshoot and the outliers, so you do get a little bit different result there. The robust spline effect, basically sometimes you may have seen this before when you have some large waveform or some end effect. Sometimes I've seen the curls on the ends of my uh, roughness, sometimes from the startup, even when you delete that, or from a big curve. The robust spline filter is a modification of the spline filter to overcome the problem of large form <coughs> and end effects during the robust against deep valleys to drawbacks of the Gaussian filter. So you can kind of see a graphical view of how it handles it slightly differently. Filtering, scale, and separation, what cutoff should I use? If you look at this chart here, we have four different profiles and the way that we have chosen our cutoffs. You can see we can range from a 3.78 micro, micron down to a 0 0.26. From here, you can see how we're filtering out and each line here representing our cutoff, so you can see how we're changing that and changing our effects. This little screenshot here is pulled from uh, one of the manuals with our equipment, and it is a quick guide to help you choose correct cutoff parameters. There is a lot of material. This through our machine guides is not the only one out there, but it helps you choose and it helps you set up what you need to do for this. So if you're looking at RA, RQ, RSK, RKU, R Delta Q, between each of these set ranges, or if you're looking for one of the other parameters, it helps you choose. So what we're saying here as far as our sampling length, our cutoff values, what cutoff should we use? 
So each of these, I'm going to just choose this one right here. Maybe we are using a 0.8 cutoff in this case. From here, if we are doing our nominal sampling lengths, standard of five, that would give us a four millimeter trace. In that case, maybe our RA needs to be between 0 0.1 and two. <coughs> and again, there is a slight overlap here, so according to where you fall at, maybe you have to play with that just a little bit to find the exact one. Roughness filter cutoff lengths as determined by the X and I have a character missing. Aspects of the surface under the evaluation as related. As you can read this, basically it is just the relations between it. And this right here was with ISO 96. Let's look at some setup conditions for form removal. When we look at form removal, there are a couple different or some different options that we can choose for our form removal. Typically, if I'm trying to measure something that it is representative of a straight line, I would use the least square line. If I'm using something that maybe has an interrupted surface, and I know both ends is where I want to level to, I would use both ends. But the two most common are least square line and least square circle. And basically what that does is that tries to give you the form removal that you need to make your profile curve come to the straight line that you see on your graph. So a lot of times you've probably taken a trace and you see something that comes up on your graph like this where it's kind of running downhill. Once we apply, in this case, maybe the least square line gives us the after our tilting and leveling, basically it's going to level that out and tilt that to a straight point. I, you do notice that the magnification has increased, but this is the same trace. It has leveled it to a zero level point for evaluation. Maybe if you're looking at the curve itself, if you try to take a roughness profile around a curved surface, maybe you get an RA of 550 micro inch, then once you remove the residual error, that may reduce down to about a 35 micro inch by applying the least square curve to this one. We can also look at some graphical representations of surface finish. I know <coughs> this is more common now than it used to be as far as looking at the graphical representation. Maybe we can look at, oh, we have something right here. A lot of the software now helps us to zoom in on that area. We see the three points here. At this point, we zoom in here, and we can kind of understand, according to our graph, our widths and depths and understand where this is. Maybe this is a tool mark or a grinding mark within the surface itself. Let's look at some parameters. Surface texture parameters are simply statistical <coughs> values that help you describe the attributes of a profile. Again, a lot of times hard measurements are hard data. Surface finish is statistical. Amplitude, we have a set of parameters for amplitude. We have a set of parameters for averaging, spacing, hybrid, and varying areas. Again, these are taken from some of the Zeiss Agritech materials here that you can find online and everywhere else. And there's also a lot of different definitions of materials out there that describes the same thing I'm showing you here today. Again, we're looking at R, P, and W. As you see, each of these recognized here. When we're looking at valley, we're looking at below the mean line. When we're looking at RC, we're looking at the mean height of the profile elements. The P, R, P, P, and WP is the peak of the profiles. And each of these tells what we're, how the formula works for that. T, RT, PT, WT is your totals of the profile. RZ. Uh, a lot of times people have a little issue with RZ. RZ 
at the JIS 84 uh, gives you a different math than the RZ JIS the Japanese Industrial Standard 94. A lot of times it's different from the RZ at JIS 82. So the math is done differently. So be careful that you understand what standard that you are trying to measure in if you are looking at RZ. In the software, a lot of times it'll say RZJ or RZJIS to help you understand that you, which one you are choosing. Roughness averages, profile averages, waviness average, arithmetical mean deviation, RQs, PQ, WQ, root mean squares. And as we talk about RA, a lot of times you say I have an RA of 3. <clears throat> All RAs of 3 do not define a process. A lot of times you can have three totally different processes that has an RA of about 3. As you can see here, we look at a very evenly distributed pattern here, 3.21 RA. Another process here, you can see much different than the first one of 2.91, almost a 3 RA. And again here, on the last one, we have an RA of 2.97. Again, we have a somewhat rhythmic type, but totally different than the first two. So you can tell that the RA does not define a process. Many different processes could have the same RA value. RSM, PSM, WSM, basically the width of the elements, as you can see in the graph here, where they're color coded. R delta Q, R delta P delta Q is the root mean square slope, how these slope versus the mean line. And for bearing ratio, uh, this is material ratio curve profile, Abbott Firestone curve, <coughs> representing the material ratio of the line as it passes through a functional amount. Some of this may be referred to as the TP. I'm sorry, this one here is the TP. Getting my slides mixed up. RMR, PMR, WMR, and the ROC and the RMRs. You can see here how we we can take a wear point and receive the mounts off of it as well. The last thing that I want to cover is SF&G tune-up and maintenance. It's very important with your systems. If it's our system, somebody else's system, it doesn't really matter. You want to make sure that you do your annual PMs and calibrations to keep your machines in top working order. You may need to have your straightness checked. If you have a glass scale and reader head, make sure that they are working. Uh, your noise check for your profilometer, again, you want to make sure that that's one thing with the different profilometers. You don't want to introduce noise into your measurement itself, the noise vibration of the machine. Vibration check again from the environment. The environment itself can play a factor into it. One time I went to a facility and we're standing next to the machine and just having a casual conversation. We have our hand on the workbench to the measuring machine setting on. All of a sudden we feel a vibration. There's a cycle from the machine transferring to the a production machine is it made a cut or a grind or a press or something transferred up you could actually physically feel it that can be interpreted into your machine so make sure your environment's up to uh, condition stylus qualification make sure that your stylus is definitely qualified and the condition of your stylus is good we'll take a picture take a look at a couple pictures of some damaged stylus here in just a second make sure your uh, probe lenity, your signal, is good. Uh, cleaning and adjustments and lubrication of your machine, make sure that it's in good shape. And operational checks, make sure everything's operating correctly. Again, we want to make sure that our RA specimen and our linear gain styles checks, make sure that our we can confirm with RA specimens that after we've done our probe qualifications, Stylus check, gain check, calibration. A lot of times, I know our software guides you through how to actually do your calibration to help you, help you not to make mistakes, help prevent you from making mistakes. Our stylus tip quali 
classification. Calibrate only when needed, but verify as often as possible. ASME says it's necessary to, if it varies by 10% or more, if you're using a 125 micron stylus, you might expect a three micron on a new patch variation. Use the high side standard to calibrate your gain, your low side to verify the condition of the diamond. A lot of times, just a simple microscope check, if you have a microscope in your facility close to your uh, surface finish machine, it helps. This condition right here, I have seen so many times where one side of the stylus is fractured away. I've seen in this case a few times where the whole tip is broken off. And in some cases I've seen where there is actually no diamond left. I've been into customers, oh, it's measuring good. Yeah, it's really measuring good because you're measuring on this part right here. You, you've got a mechanical filter filtering out of anything that should have picked up. Let's talk just about a minute about equipment correlation as well. What, are the, what most affects the correlation in gauging systems, skidded or skidless, it doesn't matter. Our setup should be exactly the same. If you're trying to correlate two pieces of equipment, one surface finish gauge to another, one round of machine to another, contour machine, it doesn't matter. We want to make sure that we have chosen first and foremost the same standard. We're talking apples to apples as a standard that we're chosen. We want to make sure that all of our cutoff links and our filter types are exactly the same. We want to make sure that we're using the exact same tip of radius, just as already mentioned in the previous presentation, again, the larger tip radius that we get kind of acts as a little bit of a mechanical filtration. The smaller tip stylus goes deeper into the valleys, where the larger tip may not fall as deep into the valley, so we want to make sure that we have the same type of geometry. We want to make sure that our measuring speed is the same in surface finish. Again, surface finish, the correlate, the perfect thing is you'd have to start at the exact same place every time, exact same speeds, everything, but the closer you get these setups, the easier it is to correlate. Data density and lateral spacing. If one machine is taking a data point every micron and the other machine is taking a data point every half micron, you will see a vast difference in what you, your comparison data. Lateral spacing, making sure that you are taking the data in the same way. So you may have the option of long line pitch or versus the x-axis. Make sure both machines are doing the same thing. Part alignment and measurement location. Making sure that you have your part aligned correctly is very important. Again, if you are trying to measure in a straight line, making sure that you're on apex from one end to an apex on the other end on a cylindrical part always helps. Your uh, measuring location, if you're trying to compare data apples to apples to see correlation, you want to make sure that your start points are the same. It's always good if you can always find an edge rate or a very known start point. Mark your part, if it's a cylindrical part, make sure you're in the same rotation. Every time you turn a part, just even a few thousands or a few microns, you have a new trace path because your tip may be only two microns wide. So making sure that your alignment is there as well. Also, let's look at the environment and standard practices. Again, keep your machines at normal operating con uh, control environment. I understand some machines are on shop floor. If you can keep them at their uh, constant temperature, you're going to have a lot better uh, repeatability. Humidity control, again, goes with the temperature, making sure that you're staying at the right temperatures and vibration humidity. Vibration, we've already spoken to just a little bit, but a lot of times, just the least little vibration. We're trying to pick up, we have a two micron tip and we're trying to pick up the least little movement in our axis or in our stylus. So if something comes through and shakes that machine, you can physically see it a lot of times on your analysis where the machine had been vibrating. So making sure that that tugger isn't running by or the press isn't slamming down at the moment of your trace is always a, a key factor. Air conditioner deflectors, if the machine, if the air conditioner comes on and super cools your machine, it's right here above me on my machine, maybe I'm super cool on my machine, it's affecting my results a little bit. 
as to when it's not on. Making sure that your parts are clean. I believe we've already talked about that a little bit in the previous presentation. Well, I've got a little piece of something on it I'm picking up. Again, when we're looking at surface finish, small, small things can play an effect. Make sure that your tool itself is clean. The picture that you're setting your part on and your stylus as well. And most important is operator training. Make sure that the operator understands not just how to press the measure button, but to understand the process and what he or she is doing. And that's pretty much my presentation. Any questions? It's pretty good. It's Thank pretty complex topic. So. I brought a couple of parts. It was just one of later on if you can kind of just measure sure. some brands. Yeah, when we break for lunch, actually, we're going to encourage you guys to come in, into the lab or, or up to the front to see any pieces of equipment you're interested in learning something about. You can try some samples with Andy. Yeah, I, I would be yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. So next up we have uh, Laura Jasky, she's going to be discussing the blue light comet uh, system that we have here at the front. Um, you're welcome to come up while she's working on it, but uh, certainly there will be lots of opportunities at lunchtime if you want to see a scan in more detail on how she processes the data. So without further ado. Hi guys. Um, so I'm going to be talking we're going to go over the Comet today. Um, I'm going to do a full scan and just kind of explain the technology behind the blue light scanning. Um, and then we can show a real live scan here. Um, I just have this scaled model of a human tooth that I'm going to be scanning today. And we're going to compare that against some nominal data, just so we can see what kind of results we can get from the Comet in a short amount of time. Um, even though it's tucked in back here, the Comet is actually a portable system. There's a tripod that it's on with some wheels we can move it around. Um, everything is fully adjustable. It connects to a rotary table. You don't necessarily have to use the rotary table. Um, if your workpiece fits on it, it's a great tool to use. Otherwise, we can actually use the Comet to take essentially snapshots of your workpiece and move the Comet and follow it along and everything will stitch together. So. Um, the blue light technology, let me just get connected here so I can show you. There's two lenses on here, um, and based on your workpiece size, you can adjust the lenses. What we have on there right now is 250 mil millimeters, um, therefore your working volume is essentially 250 by 250 by 250. The smaller parts that you have, we're going to change the lens to a 50 millimeter lens, or say a 100 millimeter lens, and what that does is there's 5 million points taken per snapshot. And when you use a, um, a lower lens, those 5 million points are concentrated and we get finer detail when we use a smaller lens. Based on the workpiece size today, I'm using 250. The projector lens is here, the camera lens is here. The projector, in order to pick up the distortions of the workpiece, actually there's a fringe pattern that's projected onto the piece. And I'm just going to show you that really quick. Right now, I'm just going to sit to get out of the way here. I'm importing the nominal CAD data of the workpiece that I'm going to scan, and then we're going to do a surface comparison to see any deviations from the actual manufactured piece. So we can see on the workpiece, there's that fringe pattern. The fringe pattern. Um, 
sorry, the camera actually detects the fringe pattern distortion and then uses triangulation to actually figure out where the 3D coordinates are. And that's what digitizes your work piece. So I'm going to take a really quick scan on the rotary table. And the software actually really just walks you through everything, so the workflow is pretty intuitive. Based on your workpiece um, surface finish and the color, you're going to have to adjust the exposure. With this, it's white and it's matte, so we can get a really good projection of those of that fringe pattern. Um, if you're working with like a stainless steel part, or if you are working with plastics of different color, you might have to adjust that exposure time. The Comet has a sensor temperature, so when you calibrate your Comet, it's gonna be within a range of, um, I think it's 10 degrees Celsius. And then there's a status of interference, so every time I shake this, it's going to let me know that there's too much interference and I won't be able to take the measurement. So. Like I said, the workflow is pretty intuitive. I'm gonna grab a scan right now. And the first thing that it's gonna ask me is to align it to the workpiece. So I have my nominal and then I have my first scan. And then every subsequent scan after that is just going to stitch all of my basically snapshots together. So workpiece is on my left, yeah. And then I, this is my very first snapshot. So I've got about a third of that tooth captured. And I'm just going to line it up so that it matches. So I think that's good. I can see here at the bottom that my workpiece nominal and my CAD uh, point cloud that I generated with the comet have merged together. And then I'm just going to keep collecting snapshots. The whole process takes, I mean, without stopping and explaining what I'm doing, it takes a couple minutes, and then the rotary table is just going to spin and collect that point cloud. <clears throat> so we can see we've snapped successfully to our workpiece, and after that, it's just scan, scan, scan. So there's no intervention required for me. Um, what we're going to see after it acquires the next data set is just the stitching together of our point cloud. The green on the screen, that's our last scan, adding to every previous scan. And the alignment with the rotary table is just done automatically. So you can see the data acquisition versus a CMM when you have really complex geometry is just extremely fast. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, the CMM is fantastic for measuring freeform surfaces, prismatic geometry, but this just is a huge amount of data in a short amount of time. So I think I told it to take 10 measurements. We're on the sixth one now. And there's actually an editor, so we can go and clean up all of this stuff, all of this point cloud that it's collecting um, on our rotary table surface. In order to process faster, there's a setting in here. So even though this <coughs> looks quite detailed, when we look at it later, you're going to see every single tiny detail. Um, for every four points that it's collecting, I'm only viewing one point on the screen, just to keep my rotation. Anybody that works with a giant amount of data knows that it can get a little choppy when we're looking at a, a huge point cloud. What is the precision? With the 250 millimeter lens, it's about nine microns. Um, obviously, like I mentioned, when we have the smaller lens, those five million points are concentrated in a much smaller volume, so your resolution increases. Um, that would be less than 10 microns with, say, a 50 millimeter lens. So it recognizes that my table is the red space here, so I'm just going to trim that. I 
and you can see now the blue spots are my workpiece, my CAD nominal data, and then the white point cloud is my scan data. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to check the quality of my scan. Anytime I have, say, a, a poor measurement where somebody comes by and knocks this or there was vibration from a stamping machine outside the room, something like that, anytime I have a questionable measurement, you'll notice on the right-hand side there's actually a color gradient and it will tell you which measurements um, have a lot of noise. So you can omit them or take the snapshot again and add them back into the point cloud. So everything looks pretty good. I'm just going to do a little optimization process. Looks like there's a small divot in here, but I'll just move on. So two minutes, I want to say, I took this um, point cloud, and now I can create a mesh from that. So I'm going to create an STL from my point cloud. There's a couple different algorithms that you can use when managing the data. So quality control, we want as obviously as little loss as possible. Design and reverse engineering will reduce the, the number of facets in the STL that it creates. Um, then you can take it to any reverse engineering software um, and it just tidies up the edges a little bit for you. that I've created. Now I didn't really get in any of these spots. If I wanted to fill in the gaps, I can just put this on an angle, take a single snapshot instead of the rotary table, and then fill in any blanks that I have. So it's pretty flexible that way. Um, you don't have to commit to doing the full rotation again. You can just fill in the blanks where you want. And then I can go and take a look and do a surface comparison. So I had my nominal CAD data, and then I have my actual manufactured piece. And you can see, in less than five minutes, I have a surface comparison where I can see the real deviations from my manufactured piece to the nominal. You can adjust your upper and lower limits right within the software. You can also take this into Calypso, the STL data. So if you have a program that you run on the CMM, and you want to maybe run this point cloud through your normal inspection program, you can actually bring it right into Calypso as well. That way you're not really learning another software if you're already used to using Calypso. Um, and like I said, you already have inspection plans. That whole point cloud can just be imported. And if you've ever run in simulation mode to test a program or to test a report, um, how it looks in Calypso is very similar. So you import the point cloud and it just runs through all your features and characteristics and provides your usual report. You can adjust, let's see. So that updates live. You can take a screenshot and send this to whomever. It's a really quick way of troubleshooting uh, large deviations, correcting issues on parts, etc. So we can do another scan if you want. Um, if you have any questions about the software or about the data collection process, about the technology, feel free to jump in anytime. Do you want to bump over to questions? Everybody maybe want to see something up close or ask a question? Go ahead. It's a little I wrote bit. another part. It's, it's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Sure. All right. Yeah, absolutely. So you have a really tiny part? Yeah, it's kind of So this might require me to change the lens, just so we can get a fine amount of detail, but we can take a look at it anyways. I'm glad you have this part because it brings up some of the good applications of the Comet. So the Comet is great for parts that are difficult to handle. Um, let's say they're silicone parts, you have gaskets, rubber parts, parts with a surface finish that you don't want to scan on the CMM. Um, Parts that are matte, 
are fantastic parts to scan on the comet because those projection lines are very important to see and they're very important to be crisp on the part. Anytime we get into reflective surfaces, um, there's a number of different things that we can adjust with that exposure that I showed you. Um, but we may need to coat the part. You can use a developer spray, uh, talc powder, something like that, just to get the reflectivity cut down. So let's go ahead and we'll see what we can pick up. Like I said, if I have to change the lenses, when we go to lunch, I'll happily change them over and we'll get a full scan for you. So this isn't actually too bad. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just do a rotary measurement on here to try and get as much of the part as I can. Now we don't have a work piece to evaluate this part against. But what we can do is scan as much data as we possibly can, trim that surface of the rotary table, and then we'll be able to convert that to an STL. Now again, if we wanna get finer resolution and a more crisp image of that part, or crisp point cloud of that part, we'll switch the lenses and uh, I'll show you how that works as well. So basically with the lens change, we're gonna reduce our field of view and concentrate the points in that smaller measuring volume. With the blue light, um, I don't know if you might be familiar with white light technology, but the blue light actually, the advantage of that is that it doesn't have as much of an effect from other light sources in the room. So we use the blue light scanning technology I just have to try and match this up. So that surface is that surface, and that is that. Looks good. I find parts that work the best for Comet or where Comet really shines. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I was just wondering, some scanning technologies require markers to be placed all over the part. Does the Comet require that? That's a great question. You can opt to use marker measurement. Yeah. When I use marker measurement or when I opt to use marker measurement, it's typically when I have surfaces where some slipping might occur. In the example that I used, there was enough discernible geometry where it can mesh the uh, images together or the measurements together. When you don't have enough discernible geometry, you can use marker measurements and it will align using the markers. You can also use markered fixtures too and instead of putting it on the actual workpiece. Up here, it's hard to see and I just put my finger in the measurement, but um, there's markers on the rotary table, so if I had something that I wanted to use the markers for, oh, you can kind of see the markers show up on the table there. Um, but it just depends on what kind of part you're using. When you have a smaller field of view, like I really wanted to get a very data dense scan using a 50 millimeter lens, but the part is large, I might use markers to stitch together certain areas. So we're halfway through the scan. 
Let's we'll see what the quality looks like. Does the accuracy increase with the smaller lenses or the larger lenses? Like yeah. So the, I think with this one, the highest lens is 500 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And those 5 million points are dispersed through the 500 by 500 by 500. The 5 million points, when you're using the 50 millimeter lens, your level of detail that you get is obviously much greater and therefore your accuracy will increase because just, yeah, yeah, it's just budgeting your points over which lens you choose. So as soon as I saw that tiny part, because I want to capture as much detail as possible on the small little features, intuitively I just go to switch the lenses. When you switch the lenses, you'll do a calibration verification. Um, and the calibration of this, it's probably about five minutes, and just calibration plate that you use with a series of dots on it. Oh, I'm right in this thing, I'm sorry. Um, so it's a calibration plate with a series of dots and you put it in different positions and it verifies the calibration of the machine. So it's really quite quick. If you want after, I can show you how to do the calibration. But every time you switch the lens, you should do that to ensure it's still calibrated. Laura, how repeatable are the measurements that you can take with this? Um, again, depending on the lens and what features you're looking for. No, I don't Were you saying have a value right off the top of The accuracy of the lens is, when you're using the 250 mil millimeter lens, is anywhere for between 10 and 16 microns. And then it increases with the reduction of the lens size. Now the repeatability of each measurement, um, if the conditions are the same, so the coating hasn't changed on the part of you using coating, and your scanning methodology is the same, usually it's within, I mean, we did it with Alberto, and it was less than two microns between parts. And that was using the 250 millimeter lens. Um, but I'd have to get more info on the technical details, or we can do a study for you. Are we done? Mm -hmm. So I might want to bring this up. Okay, we'll just get rid of the whole table. So there was definitely some interference because I can see lines. Um, we'll just go ahead and switch the lenses because the quality of the scan is gonna be much better when we switch the lenses. I don't think we're really gonna get all the tiny little radii. It looks like either rads on each edge or broken edges, um, but I'll gladly scan it for you. But that there's a feature on one side which is kind of weird in shape with one end of the fan. Oh, okay. So we'll scan it after, and then we can focus specifically on that. No problem. Good. Go ahead. What, in terms of picturing, like materials or, or the restrictions for this machine? Anything reflective or clear. So if you're using fixturing, yeah. um, you just want to make sure that any markers that you have on the fixture is visible. Um, I would stay away from reflective fixtures if possible because any reflectivity from the fixture might impact your measurement. We had a customer who, who was using almost like a mirror finish fixturing plate where you could thread spring clamps into and it actually caused noise in the measurement so they anodized it to be like a matte black. What about like magnetic? No problem at all. Okay. No problem at all. There's no... Um, What's that? 
Yeah, I don't think the the magnetic fixture would have any. No. No. I was just thinking in terms of the mechanics of the rotor table, let's say. Or... No, I mean we've used magnetic V blocks on here before yeah. okay. without issue. Um, we also have a lot of vidi clamping and vidi fixturing in the lab, which is just aluminum fixturing, and we haven't had any issues with that. That being said, it's not extremely reflective, and even Play-Doh. Yeah, know, we've used thing. that, or because <clears throat> it doesn't matter if it, even if it moves a little bit while it's rotating, because it stitches it together in the next position. It, it looks for a best fit every single time it rotates. So. Does do you have that model in there for it to be able to stitch it properly? No. Nope. No. It so has a really intelligent following geometry. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to take care. What, <laughs> what you would do um, is if you're using the rotary table and you want to stitch a scan together where you don't have a workpiece, make sure that the increments of the rotations are enough to have geometry in both scans that you can snap together. So if you're capturing a quarter of a circle and the other quarter of the circle, there's nothing that it can use to snap together. Typically 10 rotations oh, on here is the default 10 or 12 and that ensures that we're covering enough like a little bit of a redundancy in each scan to use it to stitch together. Now in terms of doing measurements, you need to import the, the STL into another software to actually take measurements of the scan? Or? There's... Like if you don't have a workpiece to compare it to because you're just doing Absolutely. So if you have Calypso, you can bring that STL point cloud in and without a workpiece. The way that it works, pretend you're taking a manual measurement on the CMM. So I would start to construct features on my STL point cloud as if I were actually, say, probing if I had a cylinder, I would take a series of points and define a cylinder in that location. So one, two, three, one, two, three, my cylinder starts to create itself within Calypso. I would adjust my nominals, obviously. I would do an alignment um, within this software first, and then it will bring in that alignment into Calypso. Um, from that point on, if you have a planar surface, you would just click on the point cloud and it will start to generate your features. And then from there, you would just create your characteristics. Um, your strategy. So it construct a plane in a certain location. You would use a strategy just like any other Calypso program. And if you had, say, a polyline from the edge of the plane, it's just going to use the points that are located in the area of your strategy. If you wanted to do like a CAD evaluation in Calypso, when you had the plane constructed, um, when I create a polyline, maybe instead of that I would use a grid or something like that. And that way I'm pulling as many of the points out of the point cloud to evaluate as I possibly can. When you do that though, the amount of data density is so huge, um, you just have to be mindful that you're not trying to pull 30,000 points out of a plane just for processing alone. Um, because as you know, anytime that you get a huge amount of data, it's going to process every single point against the nominal. So. Usually I do a grid and maybe try to pull three, 5,000 points out, and that's typically enough to do a really good CAD evaluation or like a surface comparison. That's it, everybody's yeah. satisfied, I think, yeah. Well, yeah. you can always ask questions at lunch too when you see it uh, on your scan. Okay, well we thank Laura for showing us the Thanks. blue light comet scanner. And uh, I guess next up is uh, Chris Daly with the uh, CT. Uh, so I'll point with my Thank you. Thanks, John. break? We can try a break. Oh, yeah. Does anybody need a break? We could take a brief intermission and restroom, refreshments, anything you need. So. So here I'll just put this kind of on uh, on uh, pause here for a second. Yeah. Oh, absolutely.
manager for Zeiss with uh, responsibility for the entire portfolio. And when I listen to my colleagues like Andy and Laura present and go into the kind of detail that they go into, I'm always really glad that they're on my team. And uh, I, you know, our, our relationship with Elliot has been long, wide, and deep now for, as Jeff mentioned, over 20 years. And it's, uh, it's, it's one of the relationships that we're really proud of. This is going to be quite a bit different. The, uh, the presentations that you've seen have been very much mining right down into the actual data and showing you specific application examples. We're going to, with this presentation, uh, take a, a little different direction, maybe go up to about 5,000 feet. You all have an advantage over me in that you know exactly what your parts look like and I don't. So as we go through, if you have anything, just I guess what I'm asking you all to do for the next few minutes is just dream with me a little bit and think about this technology and if you have questions about how it would apply to your particular parts, you can wait till the end if you're more comfortable doing that, but we're here to talk about it, we're here to dream together a little bit and have a little bit of a discussion about how the technology works, okay? So, right. first, a little bit about us, and uh, Jeff already played the Moments film, so I won't rehash this very much, but we're part of a larger organization. Andy and I are employed in the Research and Quality Technology Group at Zeiss, and we represent about 25% of the headcount and about 25% of the annual revenue for the company. We like, we, we like to brag about ourselves, I apologize, but not really. One of the reasons that, that we have the success that we have is we've been in the business for uh, over 150 years and we are in many ways the 500 pound gorilla in a lot of the uh, segments that we cover. <coughs> CT technology currently is not one of them put this slide in here primarily everything that my colleagues Laura and, and Andy were talking about if you again zoom up a little bit what do the people in this room care about mostly where is it how big is it and what does it look like when you think about measuring your parts those are the questions that you're answering right where is it, how big is it, and what does it look like? What we can do now with x-ray technology, instead of looking at the part, we're looking through it. And we're getting an actual digital representation of that part. And you're going to hear me say that word. That's one of the key takeaways. It's a true digital representation of the, of the workpiece. This particular presentation was built more for the plastics industry and you'll know why by the end but it's we're certainly not trying to exclude people that make metallic components but you'll see why as we go through this we work with our partners on the microscopy side in terms of the very high resolution product to the measuring products that I'm going to talk about and that I specialize and we also have the full production uh, capability as well. So we can actually do monitoring of the process. Okay. The systems themselves are a little bit nondescript from the outside because the outside of the units are essentially cabins to protect from radiation. It's important to point out when you use these products nobody gets dosed with any radiation. Everything stays inside the cabinet, but they are actual x-ray machines. So if we look at one without the cabin, this happens to be a Metrotom 800-225, okay? And you'll know what those numbers mean by the time I'm done speaking with you. If you think about that, that looks a lot like a CMM from Zeiss. You all own Zeiss CMMs, and thank you for being Zeiss customers. And before I forget, if business or pleasure ever takes you to Germany, we'd love to have you at the factory. 
and it's, it's, it's really worth getting in the car and driving to the factory. There's a great museum there. It's in a great small town where all the people who live in that town practically work for Zeiss. It's, it's, it's quite something. So consider yourself invited to the factory if you're ever over in Germany. <clears throat> it's an advantage for me to be talking to a group like this that already owns Zeiss CMMs because what we have are very accurate machine ways. We have a fixed distance, a fixed calibrated distance between a thing called an x-ray source or referred to as a tube, a flat panel detector, and a rotary table. Okay. The science, or maybe I should say the physics of x-ray has really not changed fundamentally in the last 20 years. Industrial x-ray has been around for about 20 years. We are, for our part at Zeiss, perfecting or trying to perfect the use of industrial x-ray in measuring technology. Yeah? In much the same way as our founders didn't invent microscopes, they perfected them. Right? We didn't invent coordinate measuring machines, we perfected them and we're continuing to perfect them. We didn't invent industrial computed tomography technology, we are endeavoring to perfect it. But what happens? This is the physics behind it. We take the standard electricity from your building. We have what's called a high voltage generator. It comes to a high voltage cable. As I mentioned, we have a couple of different source power sizes. The example here is a 225 kilovolt source. All right? So the high voltage comes in. Sorry for the lack of control here. The high voltage comes in through a filament and a beam of electrons is created, all right? We focus that beam of electrons electronically down to what's called a focal spot on what is referred to as the target. And you're probably sitting there wondering, why is this guy telling us this stuff? It'll make sense in a minute, I promise. We either hit a small piece of tungsten about the size of my little finger, or we use molybdenum foil that's about 200 microns thick. When that beam of electrons hits that target, what's created about 90% is heat. About 10% of that is a resultant cone beam x-ray. This would be a great time to ask, are there any, is there anybody here in the room that has a degree in radiographic imaging? Oh, good. No. Um, if, if somebody said yes, I would let them correct all the mistakes I make. But fundamentally, this is, this is how it works. And I, I make mention of that because that is radiographic imaging. That's how radiographic <coughs> imaging works. We have the x-ray tube. We have the flat panel detector, and what that is is it's a pixel array with a, a portion of it called a scintillator layer. That cone beam is generated from that focal spot. So on the most accurate systems, they are lower power. That focal spot size is smaller. The cone beam is projected, and we get natural magnification of the workpiece as we rotate it in front of the x-ray source. How many people in the room have had a medical CT scan done on themselves? Okay. In that scenario, the source or the tube and the detector are on a ring that goes around you. It's not really practical to rotate a person in front of the source, but with small prismatic components, it's much more practical in industrial CT applications to rotate the source, or sorry, to rotate the workpiece in front of the source. Okay, high accuracy rotary table, <clears throat> take 
really, I don't think there's an upper end of how many projections, but generally we take between 1,200 and 2,000 projections, get 2D image arrays that are 1,200 by 1,200 pixels. So 1,200 times 1,200 times 1,200, that's the type of data set that we're looking at. So very high point data density, yeah, and we call this our magnification axis. I mentioned a minute ago that you guys all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, you folks all know what your parts look like, and I don't. Your parts might be metal, they might be plastic, they might be mixes of metal and plastic. I chose not to go into a lot of detail about the specific applications because there's a lot to talk about in each of those categories, but fundamentally, if your part is small, I saw one gentleman there had a very small part. If we can get really close to the source, then we can get a lot of natural magnification and get a very high resolution image. <clears throat> if the part is bigger or denser, the resolution will be less. Some good talking numbers on these systems in terms of resolution, about four microns, seven microns and six microns. That's the smallest thing we can see, okay? Oh, almost forgot. We have some techniques now that we can deploy. We have that uh, <coughs> y-axis, so we can actually measure workpieces that don't fit in the measuring envelope. We can rotate them as we're moving them and build those images together as long as we can rotate them in front of the source and the detector and not hit anything. Generally speaking, the, the part sizes on the, on the measuring size machines, imagine something about 150 mil, 170 millimeters by 150 and then one that's 205, sorry, 260 by about 305 and the very high resolution systems, Zeiss purchased a company called X-Radia a few years ago. What X-Radia figured out, and they build these machines in Pleasanton, California, you saw how in uh, that diagram of that X-ray source, how the, the photons, sorry, the electrons are focused down to a small spot size. What X-Radia did is they actually use objective lenses and they can send those photons through the objective lenses to achieve very good spatial resolutions down to like 0.7 microns, so 28 millionths spatial resolution. Very long scan times in the hours, measured in the hours, very much for R&D. And I, I don't know, I was, I was a little worried that this would be, be a problem, but that that's 150 microns. So what we're talking about is very small regions of interest on the parts, okay? And it's, it's materials analysis, okay? And this is, this is just kind of a thing, again, we're looking at 325 microns here, and this is just actual video of, of or this video is built on actual <coughs> data. We can take planes and cut through, and I don't know what this thing is, but it was just interesting that we can get that 3D voxel data set by rotating that workpiece in front of that source, take all those 2D images, and build one 3D image that we can slice and dice in uh, regions of interest in the, in the 45 micron care category. So that's the X-Radia component now, where I spend most of my time, and try not to waste too much of Jeff's time, is in our Metrotom. So Metro being measurement, Tom being tomograph, measuring tomography instrument. Two sizes, the 800 and the 1500. Those numbers refer to the distance between the source and the detector. This is not, I mean, I am a sales guy, I can't help it, but this isn't about trying to sell anybody one of these machines. 
the differentiator with the Zeiss computed tomography products, a key takeaway of this is we focus on our metrology capability. These machines all use Calypso, and Calypso is Calypso is Calypso. It's exactly the same Calypso that you already know how to use, that Laura is a, a Jedi master at, and that a lot of people at Zeiss understand fully. Additionally, we have a couple of different software products for doing NDT type analysis, so for looking at voids, porosity, inclusions, that type of thing. Okay. All right. That might look a little bit familiar. You've probably seen that on all of the, you've seen the trumpet chart outputs for all of your CMMs. We devised in accordance with VDI and VDE 2630, something that emulates ISO 10360. We have an array of our uh, stylus spheres, and I don't know if everybody can see it or not, but right here is we've got a marker on that particular one so that we can clock this uh, calibration artifact. And if you look at the actual grayscale images, we measure that in three different Z heights, three different Y positions. Why am I telling you all of this? Because this gives us an accuracy statement through the entire measuring volume, just like your coordinate measuring machine, okay? There are a lot of CT instruments on the market that have, that they're, it's not that they're not accurate, but they are calibrated at each position we like to brag, and it's, it's the truth, it's a differentiator for us, that our accuracy statement is anywhere in the measuring volume, okay? Okay. You've been looking at a lot of charts today. You know what this is. This is CMM measurement output in, uh, in, in tabulated, right? And the, the, the message there is just this is a CMM, okay? So, a real advantage of this technology, again, assuming that we can scan your parts effectively, you've already seen a very good demonstration of a structured light system. Any type of structured light system can measure what it sees. With the CT system, we have to be able to penetrate it. We can penetrate a wide variety of materials. Low density stuff is really easy to do. The plastic stuff's real easy to do. You can measure geometry that you can't see and that you can't touch, as well as be able to see the, the flaws in the material itself, and we can actually quantify those flaws. Where are they? How big are they? What do they look like? Okay? So with a, with a full digital image, <coughs> not image, a full digital representation. So the repeatability, since it is truly digital, is practically spot on. It's, it's, <coughs> it's almost comic when we end up doing R&R uh, &R tests on these for customers. The results are s so good, they repeat almost perfectly. If you have a reverse engineering requirement and your component lends itself to x-ray inspection, it's a, it's a very good reverse engineering tool because it's a very accurate digital data set. In many cases, more accurate than what you could get with a, uh, a surface type of scanner, okay? So we have a, a, a respectable <clears throat> business that is built up. Jeff mentioned it briefly, offering contract services uh, where we actually do take that, that big six or 10 uh, gigabyte data file, create a very accurate STL and create a mod and surface that to create a model for <clears throat> to do actual reverse engineering, okay? Common applications in the plastics industry, being able to look through the components means, of course, that you can interrogate the, the thread engagement, 
on threaded components. You can look at assembled components to see if things are in the right place or if they're cocked inside there. Okay. Oops, sorry. Can I ask you what sort of uh, material limitations you have with this machine? You certainly can, and I'll even answer it. The, uh, what, when we get up, we, we do okay up to about titanium. When you get into the tool steels, anything with a high chromium content, um, that's where we struggle. The exception being if it's a very prismatic component, that is to say it's, it's a high density component, but there isn't, sorry, there isn't a long scan path or what's called the radiographic scan length. If we can get it close to the source, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating in terms of can we get a good scan on it or not. We have systems that go up to higher power and that's, that's I'm going to talk about those for just a minute. But one of the things that we encounter when we talk to people is, why can't you simply get an x-ray source with more power to penetrate that? The reason is, it's, it's almost like when you have a photographic situation and you flood the subject with too much light, it just washes out the picture. The, the same is true, you can get, you can get enough x-ray power to be able to penetrate, but your data is just no good. It's just a big blob. It's it's not useful for anything. So stainless, so, uh, stainless steel, for instance, if they're if they're small, if it's like a, a tooling components for an injection molding machine or something like that, not so much. What we do instead is, if you have a multi-cavity tool. We look at the shots that come off of that with the, uh, you know, we, we look at the, the samples that you run and we can do a lot with our Zeiss RE software in terms of shortening the development of new tooling, but we can't really interrogate the tools themselves because they're just, they're just too dense and we can't penetrate them with x-rays. So that's, you know, and, and besides, I mean, the guys that are selling the Active scanning CMMs, they still got to eat, right? I mean, so that's that's why you that's why you have those expensive place CMMs. Right? Those are aluminum, aluminum. Uh, aluminum, yeah. We can we can absolutely do aluminum. We're we're <clears throat> and thank you for for asking these questions. Aluminum is fantastic for CT, and we can usually measure it. It's all about how dense it is. Like automotive pistons, we've had some very good success with doing metrology as well as NDT analysis on pistons. I've got a video at the end um, that we did a project for BMW on actual engine blocks. Not doing metrology, same story. So much power is required to penetrate the workpiece. We can control it though, get a good grayscale image and look at defect analysis, but not so much metrology. But we've got, we, we have instances now where customers, it takes six hours to measure the component on their CMM, and we're measuring it in 45 minutes with a CT machine. What was it you'd be interested in with the uh, scan? Is it tooth? Is it tooth? Tooth or, or for us? Yeah. Palgo micro. Yes, so generally. It, it's it's going to depend on um, if, the, if the parts are uh, have a lot of heft to them, like if they're big gears or something like that, we're not so much for two, there's a smaller for housing type smaller thickness wall thickness analysis, that works great. We'd love to take a run at it, we'd love to try it, right. okay? And so powdered metal, hard to say, sometimes on threaded components, yeah, I mean, so, sorry, what happens when you raise up the power to penetrate a component, you get what are called artifacts created. The photons are hitting and losing energy, so they're kind of going off in, in different directions and, and hitting the detector panel, and you're, you're getting these images, you get ghosting and what are called Feldkamp effects and that type of thing. We're, we know they're there and there are some algorithms to correct for that, but in some cases, if the scan length is just too long, then you, you just can't overcome it. Um, but if they're, if they're 
you when you did that, I got encouraged. If, if you'd have gone like that, I would have said, well, probably not. But when you go, oh yeah, that we can do. Same story, we can get closer to the source, make the scan time a little bit longer, the integration time a little bit longer. The next question out of everybody's mouth is, how fast is it? And I don't blame them, everybody's interested in fast. On the volume X side of things, we're down to scan times in the seconds, in the metro time, in the, in the metro time we're scan times in the minutes. On the X-radia component, we're at scan times measured in hours. Okay. I like showing this one because people are like, can we automate this? Absolutely, we can. If there's some interest in, in your company, you know, in your company based on what I've been talking about for the last 25 minutes or so, and I can tell that you, you're engaging on this and you're you're giving yourself a chance to dream with me a little bit. What we are always interested in doing is once we determine that we can scan your component effectively, then we can look at tools to do more than one at a time, you know, that kind of thing. You do it at some sacrifice of the uncertainty budget. All right, because that uncertainty budget is going to be just on that one part that fits in the measuring volume. That resolution is going to be cut in half if you do two parts, and the resolution was three microns. You know, it's only going to be six microns when you're doing two parts, right? Because you, you know you're, you're measuring twice as much area. Okay, you can't get as much magnification, but we have techniques, and this also shows the fixturing for for these machines is very simple. It's just low density foam. If people get into applications where it's uh, more complicated, then um, 3D printing has been a real boon to the fixturing for um, doing automated metroton inspection. Okay. Excuse me. So this is just this is just an illustration. You you guys can read. I'm not going to read through this, but this is just showing that we've got a lot of flexibility as far as how we set up parts how we automatically do the analysis, and how we automatically produce the results. Okay. Does, um, does anyone here have any mixed material parts, things that are metal and plastic? That's like one, one by one. So for example, the oil pump, aluminum housing outside, the inside we have powder metal and the uh, steel, Okay, um, the steel insert may be a, a source of some heartbreak for us because what will end up happening, and um, if you'll remember back, I won't spend time clicking back to, to, to prior slides, but when you, hit, when you saw that, the, the grayscale image, if the x-ray is not penetrating something, it just manifests as a very bright light. So in your case, if we get the power settings appropriate, to penetrate the aluminum and the powdered metal, and we could see the contrast, we wouldn't have, potentially, we wouldn't have enough power to penetrate the steel rod that's in there, and that's going to show as a very bright spot in there. We have some um, mixed material corrective algorithms that may be able to remove that from the calculation. It would be the same story. We'd love to try it and see what kind of results that we could get for you. Oh, yeah, sorry. So the, the, the beauty of the CT now is we do have those algorithms developed. The, what manifests is when you have the, the mixed material, you have the metal and the, and the plastic, the plastic being low density, the machine can see both and it knows there's two types of material there, but what ends up happening is the machine has a, a difficult time differentiating the boundary between the metal and the plastic. So our AMR, A-M-M-A-R, Advanced Mixed Material Artifact Reduction Algorithm, what that does is it's essentially an iterative algorithm that determines that interface accurately between the metal and the plastic. The, the, the classic application for that is connectors. Yes. So if you make connectors, 
we need to talk. More charts, just and, and again, since my colleagues have already done such a great job, and there's there's going to be another pie web presentation, and I, you know, Laura would mop up the floor with me as far as talking about pie web, so I'm just going to let her do it. I mean, a man has to know his limitations, right? So we can kind of um, <coughs> go through this, and then we'll turn this down a little bit, Jeff. So, again, a little bit dramatic, I apologize, I, but I, I do like the, the, the way this illustrates that what we have is a full digital representation that we can do practically anything we want with it. next to no time that's a little bit fraudulent it does take some time great illustration of how the machines work very simple fixturing rotate the part take 1200 to 2000 projections software package full disclosure it is more of a tool correction but the answer to your question is absolutely positively yes you can take that data cloud and using the volume graphics product or there are some other commercially available products out there you can create an STL from that that you can use to create a model This particular product, yep, this is our Zeiss Neo Insights. This is a, a, a software product we're in development on right now. Um, the the 400-pound gorilla of voxel data set management is a company called Volume Graphics, and we are a reseller of the Volume Graphics product as well. But we are in development of our own uh, voxel data set analysis tool. It's interesting to point out this is the, I, I, I really like what this illustrates those fixtures with the multiple parts go into the machine they are scanned and each of those parts is broken out into its own individual data set automatically and the uh, uh, analysis of, analysis of that can be automated as well so we're coming up on, on lunchtime. I'm gonna I'm gonna end it there. Um, what I what I might do is maybe just turn the sound down, but run some of those other videos while we're having lunch or something sure. like that. If people yeah. wanna uh, watch those, and shameless advert for the company. Sorry. Please think about us for contract services because you, it's a good way to to look at whether or not some of this technology might be able to find a home in 
your company is is based on using us for some uh, ongoing type of, of inspections because you find out what works and what doesn't. So happy to answer any more questions. Um, appreciate everybody's engagement. You'll probably at some point be getting some sort of um, evaluation form. I'm very interested to hear back because one of the things that we're trying to do at Zeiss, we know a lot about coordinate metrology, but we're, we're trying to figure out what the best way is to do the presentations on the CT side of the business. So if it was not technical enough or, or too technical or you would have liked to have learned more about you know specific models or talked less about it. anyway please fill out the event you know do please do critique my presentation if you would take a minute and because I, I'm interested to hear feedback especially from a group of, of all Zeiss users because it's important to us to find out what what our customers are interested in hearing so that we hit the bullseye more often oh no you did a very good job Oh, thanks. So, <laughs> appreciate it. Okay, so yeah. Oh, by all so, means. Uh, just a question. Uh, maybe it's a bit outside. How the CT technology can recognize materials by you know the uh, power of the X-ray? The so can recognize like plastic, aluminum, uh, and so on. Yes. I even know the answer to that. So, um, if you go, and again, this this part of it has nothing to do with Zeiss and everything to do with physics. In a radiographic imager, when you when that when that cone beam of photons goes out, the photons merely go through the workpiece, assuming you've got the power settings correct. It goes through the workpiece and hits the detector panel. Okay that cesium scintillator layer on the detector panel creates, an, you know, has, is, is energized and, and creates a pixel, you know, light, lights a pixel. So your real-time images, if you remember that, that slide that I showed with the X-radia, it's grayness. Black is air. Bright light is material that the X-ray can't penetrate. Everything else is, is gray level, gray scale. Okay, so the way it differentiates different, so, so the way it sees different material densities, it, it looks at the level, the, the gray level between the two. Okay, so when you have mixed materials, that's what it ends up doing to, to correct for the, the, the light streaks and things that show up. It's like, oh, I know what's going on here. I'm not. Uh, differentiating properly the boundary layer and I didn't I didn't explain this but it'll just take a second <clears throat> so we take the 1200 to 2000 2d images we have a reconstruction PC that has our Metrotom operating system software that takes those 1200 images looks at where they are in the in the rotation and builds that 3d Voxel, voxel being a volume element, like a pixel, pixel is a picture element. We're now using volume elements. So now we've got all these volume elements that is a true th 3D representation, but all it's looking at is the, 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 the ones and zeros produced by that detector panel to, to build that <coughs> data cloud set. So that's how it knows. The machine shows our eye on the output the different gray levels, so that an operator can look and say, oh yeah, that's air, that's aluminum, there's the plastic. Did, I, did that answer it? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any other machines here? Potentially if we can scan that part and compare two scans between the light and CT. We don't have a CT in the building. Uh, we will have one at CMTS this year in a couple of weeks, uh, September 23rd. Uh, so, I mean, if you'd like to bring your, it's a small enough part. Is it, may, may I handle that part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Uh, That's a stainless steel. Okay. Then, yeah, just, just looking at this part. So, the, the machine that we're going to have at CMTS is a 130 kilovolt system with a total target performance of 39 watts. What did I just say? 
it doesn't have the juice to get through this stainless steel part. It's more for low density material. What I'll have to do is we'll have to make some arrangements, sorry, so we can put this on a machine with a 225 kV higher power source so that we can try to penetrate it. And we may be able to, we may not be, but if we can fixture this just right, get it n nice and close to that, to that cone beam, the apex of that cone beam, so we get some good magnification, natural magnification on the detector panel. I, you know, all we can do is try. And, you know, the, the other, the other watch out is going to be the fact that it's, it's threaded inside there. So, yes, because that, that just makes the photons kind of go, yeah, carefully. So everything, everything has a downside. <laughs> And uh, the, the, the downside for CT is, is high density material, but love to take a shot at it. Any, any other questions for Chris? Thank you very much, Chris. It was great Thanks, everybody. So, Laura's up next, but I wanted to ask if everybody was ready for a lunch break. The food is here, we can bring it in and have a lunch, and we could potentially either do her presentation while we eat something, or we can just have a little break and eat something. What does everybody think? Is it? Can we take a break, eat lunch, or do you want to push forward with her last presentation? Okay, hands up for a presentation, hands up for a sandwich. Nobody? Doesn't matter? <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, we might as well go ahead and do your presentation then, and just afterwards we can just do the lunch and then uh, maybe any questions or, or, you know, we can see the equipment close enough. Though. Can we change the source? to do a presentation that a lot of us can relate to. Anybody with Calypso 2015 and higher is hopefully going to take a lot away from this. Um, high web reporting has been included with Calypso 2015 and higher. And I'm going to go over everything that Pi web reporting does and everything that Pi web as a whole aims to do. We all know, we all know the custom printout. I don't know if you use this one or one of the variations of the custom printout, um, which is fine. It's, you know, pass fail as indicated. The characteristic info is easy to read. There's a few different templates that are available, so you don't necessarily have to use this particular default, um, but it's very basic. I find this is, incredibly <coughs> useful. You measure your part, you get the report, you can see obviously what's passed and what's failed. But beyond that, how do we dive deeper? Um, how do we add additional details to our report? And a lot of that is now handled with PyWeb reporting. And I know some of you already know PyWeb reporting, so maybe this is a little bit of a recap <coughs> for you. But if something fails, what do we do? With the custom printout, uh, we're going to have to go to a graphic element. We're going to have to go to CAD evaluation, panic, denial, blame, whatever happens when something fails. Um, we hope to now divert all of our digging deeper and all of our detail analysis through PyWeb reporting. The issue, or I guess some of the drawbacks to utilizing other tools in Calypso is that it requires many steps. So if you're using auto run, you have to have access to the inspection plan. You have to
have to add the graphic element, link the correct feature or characteristic. Uh, you don't have any history, so you can't view trends. If you do get a failure, could you have prevented the failure by seeing a line plot showing that it was just on the verge of being out of spec? You don't get any statistical information, so any capability studies that you want to do, you conventionally have to go to some third-party software. And then the templates, as far as header goes, user fields, um, additional information, trace fields, stuff like that, it's very hard to customize because that particular editing software really isn't updated anymore now that PyWeb has come into play. So again, like I mentioned in Calypso 2015 and higher, or 6.0 and higher, depending on what um, <coughs> naming convention you want to use, PyWeb Reporting or PyWeb Reporting Plus is included as a function of Calypso. And I'm gonna tell you how to turn it on, what kind of templates are available for you to use by default, and then we're gonna actually go into the editor. I'll show you how to access that, and just some quick tools so you can go back and create some templates of your own. This is kind of the Coles Notes editing version, um, but if you have any questions about manipulating any templates or getting any additional info from your measurement plan into the report, I'd be happy to answer that for you. So I've talked PyWeb, PyWeb, PyWeb. What actually is PyWeb? PyWeb is a program, um, primarily it's a standalone program, and it's a database where all your data gets dumped <coughs> into, and there's a few different programs within the PyWeb software package that can be used for custom templates, forms, graphs, charts, plots. We've got statistics, so you can do like a capability six pack <coughs> style if you're used to using many tabs to do your evaluations. You can actually do gauge r &Rs in PyWeb um, database, so you can manage all of your inspections and back them up. You can do a dashboard, have a big TV with all your quality statistics and information, interactive reports. Um, I'll show you some examples of all of these and manual measurement entry. So that's PyWeb in its entirety. And then we're given a slice, okay, that was not actually supposed to be a pun about Pi, but you'll get a, a piece of that as a function of Calypso 2015 and higher. This is some light reading, um, what's included in, in each level of PyWeb. These two here, PyWeb Reporting and PyWeb Reporting Plus, will be included in Calypso. The differentiation between reporting and reporting plus, this is an option, and it's also included in versions of Calypso when you get a new machine. If you are like on an older machine and you have an SMA and you're on version 6.0 and higher, you're likely going to have this. So 10 records per measurement plan. Uh, you can do custom forms. If you're in automotive, you can set up a six piece layout form with all of your measurements going directly into that. And then this option, or like I said, it's included in new machine sales. You get a thousand records per measurement plan, a bigger database, access to statistics, the gauge r and etc. I'm gonna show you what's available <clears throat> on the very, very base level. Turning it on, where can I access that? It's actually just in the multiple printouts tab. I'm gonna bounce over to Clipso in a little bit, but just to show you, you're gonna access multiple printouts, turn on multiple printouts active. You have to do this for every measurement plan and it creates a database that it's going to store your info into. If you're used to the measurement, or sorry, if you're used to the multiple printout screen, you know that in this drop down here, it shows custom printout, default printout. By default now, it's gonna be default <coughs> PyWeb reporting I'm gonna shoot out one report, and then all of my available templates, which are included, can be found here. And I'm gonna go over that with you and how to access the editor and everything. One thing to keep in mind, anytime we wanna create a report, always start with the end in mind. So am I doing a generic report where no matter what part I'm measuring, I just want the results to pump into a table of some sort. I can do specific part stories, do troubleshooting reports for specific parts. Who's gonna look at the report? Um, I might create a different report for my quality manager. 
than a report I might produce for a machinist. I would want that to be more graphical representation of, you know, flatness, 0.03 over. <coughs> How do I communicate that to a different audience? I want to show a graphical representation so they can make the corrections. I have to think about this stuff before I start building a report. That kind of ties into what info do I need to show? Maybe I want the characteristic name, nominal, upper, lower, uh, deviation. I might want to include a line plot on every single row so I can see what characteristics are starting to drift. And what do I want it to look like? Do I have header information in mind? Trace fields? Do I want the logo? Um, so anytime I start diving into a new report, I usually sketch something out so I make sure that I'm not just clicking around aimlessly in the reporter. So I'm just going to go into Calypso. So again, I'm going into multiple printouts. Make sure it's active on the top left hand corner. And I'm going to start with the very basic standard protocol, which is the PyWeb version of the default printout with more options available to us. And it's actually one of my favorite reports, as simple as it may seem at first glance. So we'll give it a second to load up. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. This is, like I said, the basically conversion <coughs> of the default printout into PyWeb. So all of our header information is here, which we can customize in PyWeb Reporter. We can use some of the printout header parameters that you may have already created in your default printout. Um, we can create custom user fields, tie them into the header. So lot number, serial number, stuff like that can all be fed into here. And then we get very similar um, graphical representation of how close we are to nominal. <clears throat> One of the coolest things is being able to articulate the results. So like I said, flatness. If I have a deviation and I'm out of spec, how do I communicate that to people you know, who have to make that correction? We're going to click on this little form plot button. And we're just going to switch to a detailed view. And I can zoom out a little bit. But anything with a form plot, like flatness, roundness, cylindricity, true position, even you can see the deviation from your nominal position. Automatically it shows, I mean this is simulated data, but if it actually has like a curvature or something to it, you can then show that to a machinist right away, and then they can go and make the correction, or if you do injection molding, you can make the correction. Um, but this doesn't require really any intervention, so it's ideal for people that are using auto run, because any inspector, this will pop up on the screen, they can just show the details, <coughs> print it off, share it with whomever. So you can see we've got profile of the line, and then anything that doesn't have a form plot, obviously, is just going to remain as a normal line item. Another thing advantageous about using PyWeb over oh, using PyWeb over the default printout is that it's actually interactive. So I can add text fields and leave notes on my report. Um, if I have something fail and a superior decides to override that and they say, okay, we're gonna make a correction, you can leave a little note. So And when I save that as a PDF, that note is going to be captured in there forever. Another awesome thing is historical data. So any feature, you can see that this is a dynamic report and it links me to literally any other graphical representation that I want to show uh, characteristic info on. I can show history on a line plot, I can go to a histogram, bar plot, so on and so forth. And Again, this is all everything that's included in your version of Clipso right now. So there's nothing unusual or nothing additional that I'm showing you. 
let's say I want to look at the history and I want to look at the last <coughs> 10 runs. It produces this automatically. So the feature of interest, I right clicked, created that line plot, and then I can shoot this off to somebody else and say, listen, it's about to fail, you need to make a correction. It's a very easy way of communicating what's happening on your end to the people who are producing these parts. So that's one of those templates. That function, by the way, anytime you right click, you can do it in any template. So whether it's a default one, one you've created yourself, um, really doesn't, doesn't matter what template you're using. And can I, and can you export in Word or in other, when you write a report and you want to? Absolutely, there's, um, I can show you, you can export to CSV or XML. So if you, um, let me just jump back in here for a second. <coughs> On the left hand side, there's a, a measurement selection button. So you can do all of your data mining. Uh, you can sort by order number, incremental part number, anything like that. So once you pull the information that you want, um, exporting it is quite easy. And like I said, it's CSV or XML. And then from there you can take it and do whatever you want with it. If, yeah, sir. Uh, just one more question. When, you, when the report comes out like this, yeah. can you say it has a PDF copy? You, absolutely you can. So if you're currently saving your custom printout as a PDF, yeah. um, I can actually show you. It's going to be complete or not? <coughs> it's, I have to think here, results to file, mm -hmm. PDF, yeah. and you would go to name for output files, mm -hmm. and let's just say for all measurement plans. Mm -hmm. What you're probably using right now mm -hmm. is the PDF yeah. file graphics. Right. What we would do is the PDF file for PyWeb reporting instead, mm -hmm. and then define our naming convention, and then whatever comes up for PyWeb would be saved automatically as a PDF instead. You just have to define which P which output you want to PDF. Okay. Uh, the, the, but the original report will stay here if you do the PDF and later you want to go and modify something, this, the original will sti still be there in the memory of them. You can bring up the report oh, again. Okay, okay. Absolutely. Um, the way that you would bring up the report again, sure. when I'm under resources results to file, mm -hmm. the best way to bring up a report that I've already run before that hasn't been saved as a PDF is to make sure that my measuring points are mm -hmm. on and table file. That way, um, if I've measured a part, it's gone from the building, but oh no, I can't <coughs> find the report. I can go up to plan, subsequent evaluation. Basically looks like the run screen. When I load up my I'm measured saving. points, <coughs> yeah, it's gonna show me okay. the last X number of runs. <coughs> and then when I say commit to that, let's say I want to pull up this report, it's going to dump all of that data back into my measurement plan, even if I've made changes. So retroactively, I want to go look at some roundness values um, this will pump all your measured points back into each feature and characteristic and regenerate a new report for you. Thank you. No problem. And I don't expect everybody to remember all of these steps, but if you want any info, I'll give you my card. You can just shoot me an email and uh, I will help you out. A couple other really cool ones that are already included is the process protocol, which is a statistical one. And if I go and take a look at that, So this shows me the number of failed characteristics over a set amount of time. <coughs> so it looks like consistently I've had, what, seven failures per part. And then it will show me the characteristics that fail over that amount of time. Then I can dive into detail. So I have a line plot, an X bar, R chart, histogram, correction value, my nominal info on the side. And that just gives you history. I mean, this is all fake data that I've just simulated, so nothing is really going to jump out at us. But 
when you're actually looking at real manufactured parts, you're going to have real deviations, which will show you trends. Um, you can set outliers in your X-bar R charts to behave differently. So if you want them to be a certain color or, or you're used to different format, like if you're doing X-bar R charts in mini tab or something, you want it to look the exact same just for continuity, you can make those changes in the editor. The editor is also found under multiple printout. I can make changes to any pre-existing template or I can create my own. For right now, I'm just gonna create a brand new one just to show you guys the actual editor, how to move things over. And I'm gonna create new protocol, which is a new report. The editor is this little pencil button, which is gonna open a designer. And right away, it's gonna ask the question, which I asked at the beginning of our, or at the end of our slideshow, is it generic? So is this report going to be able to accept data from any part, or is it specific to one part? I'm just gonna do a generic one now. So it'll ask you to name it. The, de the designer's gonna pop up. So it's very what you see is what you get. Um, it kind of has like a PowerPoint type feel is the, the way that I usually explain it. Um, all of your tools are on the left hand side so I can add different objects and then I just drag and drop them anywhere I want within the editor screen. Meaning if I don't have variant department order numbers stuff like that I can delete it or I can replace them with other variables whether they're defaulted Clipso or like I said, serial number, lot number, just things that relate to your particular business. So to give you an idea, let's say I wanna get rid of department, variant. So I'm just gonna make these changes. There's nothing, you know, no coding or anything required to manipulate stuff on the page. So if you've made PowerPoint presentations before, or you used Excel, you used Word, it's really just, not that much different. So I'm gonna move everything up a little bit. Now all I have is just a header. I don't have any characteristic table. When you hit F5, it's going to refresh your data. So now I've got the data from my last run populating into this header, and it's a good way to make sure that everything you've added or deleted well, added or modified, is connected. In your toolbox, some of your most commonly used stuff is at the top, followed by things like characteristic tables. So these are pre-made tables that you can just literally click and drag, put it on the page, and if I wanna get a preview, I'm gonna hit F11, So I've created something from nothing very quickly. I can go in later and make modifications, you know, stretch this out, add other things to my characteristic table. But it's very easy. Um, say I wanna get rid of this header here. I wanna add a text box. I move it over. Just like any other program, kind of Windows-based, you have a properties tab that you can access from the left or right click. I can change my font size, I can change the color of it. If any of you guys, and not to knock it, but if any of you guys have used QC Calc before and tried to edit a report in QC Calc, <coughs> you would know that it's very difficult to do. So hopefully we can make some custom reports for you, just drag and drop. Um, maybe I want to add an image, click and drag. And when I save that, so save report or control S, whatever you're used to, if I jump back into my multiple printout window, I now have that as an option to select from. And every measurement plan that I have that I want to use that template, I'll just make sure to have that active in my multiple printout window, and then I can use it all the time. 
Yep, you said this will replace QC Calyx reports. So can you do, like, if you had a total, if there was a run, like a batch run that you wanted to report on all characteristics that were in your program, this will be able to do that and, and put it into a format that's pretty much almost as, like an Excel sheet? Absolutely, yeah. So you can do um, another one that's really good. I'm just gonna hop out of this for one second. There's something called table protocol. And again, these are generic ones. You can kind of take it however far you wanna go. Table protocol shows you something like this, where it shows you the last X number of runs. So these are all the parts. And then from there, after I've made my selection based on whatever criteria, serial number, lot number, date, I can export this and do whatever I want with it or I can just leave it like that. It also has, if you do capability studies through QC Calc, there's something called an inspection summary report, which is kind of like a mini tab six pack. The only thing it doesn't have is the normal probability plot. Um, and that's something, <coughs> I can't get to it right now just because I have other customer files in there and I don't want to show it, but um, all the graphical statistical stuff that you get either from QC Calc or Minitab can be done directly through <coughs> PyWeb. I'm just gonna go back into the editor. So I can make a generic one or I can make a part specific one. One really cool thing about a part specific one, if you're having a lot of issues with a part and you want to be able to articulate that, you can do a CAD part story. Um, when you have your CAD model in Calypso, you would save a copy of it. So I'm going to save an STL. And just save it to my desktop. I can bring my CAD model into this report, make it a decent size, load my CAD model up. There's actually like a phenomenal example report in here that'll show you after that will show you the capabilities of um, this report editor. And then I can go and add different information about that CAD model. So if I want let's say flatness of A is very important to me every time I run the part, I might attach a form plot and a flatness plot to have show up every single time I run my report. Oops. Maybe that's a bit too big. So this is something that you can do, if I refresh that by pressing F5, it's going to show me my live flatness information. Properties, again, will change any of the information. Um, maybe I don't want a data table or a scale or anything like that just to clean it up. So I can start attaching things like this to my CAD model where it might not be a production thing for you, but you might want to have this in your back pocket if any problems come up. So that's the advantage of that. I can throw a line plot on, uh, diameter, and maybe do a line plot, throw that on there, and maybe I want the last 30 measurements. Now mind you, this is not real data, so it looks amazing. The capability is like 400. Um, but these are the kind of things that you can do with the report editor. So I encourage you to go in, try making some templates. If you have any questions, feel free to email you, uh, me. Don't email yourself. We have a class also on how to get <coughs> the most out of what's included with your Calypso. Um, so if this is something you want to know more about, like I said, email me or I can give you more information about the class specific to this. There's one really, really cool report that I would love to show you. So just to give you an idea, I definitely was not the one who made this report, although I wish I did. 
Um, to give you an idea of the kinds of report you can make, there's an interactive CAD view. So I have real deviations on this part that show the percentage out of tolerance, and I can actually manipulate the CAD model <coughs> within my report. And if there's a certain you know, viewpoint that I want to maintain, I can print that PDF without going to file, um, sorry, CAD, CAD evaluation, turn on all those things, take the snapshot. Um, so you can do this as part of your reports as well. That's the full version, right? The CAD evaluation you can do in Pi Web Reporting Plus, which is the one that holds a thousand records, but you don't have to get the full blown whole Pi Web package to do that. Everything on this page you can do with the Pi Web version that you have in Calypso, caveat being you only can see 10 records with the one that's included in there. So you'll just have 10 of the last runs. And then when you do your 11th run, it overwrites the oldest value. Does this have a filter? For example, we have all data from different machines going to one database. So I want to compare, I want to figure out, so for particular machine A, all that data, those data may not be continuous. So if I can just drag those out, put together, do this. You can eliminate or isolate different variables. So maybe I only want to look at information that came from machine number one. Right. And I don't want to see everything as a group because I've got machine one, two, three. Right. Um, there's these little search buttons on the left hand side. In this particular example, it shows batch, model, and production number. Mm -hmm. You could replace that with machine number yeah. and it's just a little configuration. So there's a bunch of pre-selected um, sorting variables that you can go. Mm -hmm. So there should be machine number or let's say tool number and I can start adding them to my sidebar. And when I <coughs> enter that information in, whether it's at run, like it should be at run time, you know, I'm measuring this part that came off machine five, okay. I can then use that information to sort and filter the data I want to see. So maybe I only want to see batch five. It's going to show you a list of available options on the sidebar. Mm -hmm. Now, this is kind of like a demo data set, so I don't know what it actually contains, but I have some real life examples I can show you where you can isolate or group by certain machines. There's a report that comes with it. So, This is just an example one, but I can actually group information by different variables as well. So if I want to look at a box plot on my characteristics for each characteristic, I can see a box plot of each machine and see which machine is always producing high, which machine is always producing on the low end. So it's a good way of saying, you know, you bring these parts into me every day um, and I'm always having issues with machine five and here's something I can show you without doing a whole lot of work so they can make that kind of correction. All of your grouping information is just in the sidebar as well. Mm -hmm. So I could group by <coughs> machine number. And if I had multiple instances of machine numbers, like right now it's grouping everything because I don't have more than one machine number, mm -hmm. but it will automatically snap it to box plots and then show you. You can also do by inspector too. So if you have manual measurements that you're entering into PyWeb, um, which is part of the full one, but I'm using it as an example. You can show which inspectors are always on the high end, which might prompt to do a gauge r, &R or additional training opportunities, stuff like that. So I have some documentation. Um, if anybody wants some information on how to get this going, basically everything that I showed you today, how to turn it on, how to access the editor, stuff like that, um, I can email like a little info package over to you that interests you at all. Good. Any other questions for, for Laura on this component? No? All right, well, we thank her for uh, the presentation.
And that pretty much wraps up our agenda for today. We just have the, the lunches here ready. We can probably, uh, I don't know if you, we should maybe just bring it in here where there's enough space for this many people. Uh, but you're welcome to uh, travel with it into the lab if you want to come and see the equipment in the lab or, or come here. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll happily show you any of the equipment that's up and running. And yeah, so that's, uh, that's pretty good. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. We're going to do more of these, maybe with a little shorter agenda. That was a lot to digest for the group, I think, one uh, day. So, uh, yeah, I, I, the lenses I think are in the lab since we didn't bring the whole case.